Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Council. Uh, we are in our afternoon session. We have a number of public hearings to get through today. Uh, and a few of these public hearings have a lot of speakers. Typically in the afternoon, we have between five and 10 speakers on a particular item. Um, but for uh, one of these items in particular, we have approximately 30 people. We wanna make sure everybody's voices are heard in this extremely important event. And the one way we ensure that everybody's voices are heard is being respectful of everybody while they're testifying. We know that there are a lot of emotions and a lot of concerns and a lot of goals that people want to share with us. Um, but we cannot hear you if we can't hear you. And so please be respectful of everybody who's testifying so that we hear every single one of you. And with that, we have six public hearings this afternoon. The first public hearing is on Bill 3423, County Minimum Wage, Wage Commission Established. This bill would establish an advisory wage commission to make recommendations to the county executive and the county council regarding minimum wages and working conditions by industry in the county. Specify the membership of duties and the wage commission and generally amend the law regarding establishment of wage commission and regarding minimum wages and labor relations in the county. A joint health and human services and economic development committee work session is scheduled for January 18th. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 11th. We have five people who wish to testify on this. Uh, the first three are in person. So I'd like to invite down Brian Levine, Melvin Thompson, and Amy Rohrer. Okay, Mr. Levine, because you are testifying on this issue and the next issue, uh, next item you have five minutes total. Speak on both. Uh, yes, speak on both right now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, members of the County Council. I am Brian Levine with the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, and we are asking the Council today to reject Bill 3423. Uh, the Chamber disagrees with the premise that it is the role of an unelected commission uh, to advise industry by industry on wages and working conditions. Having a commission like this one proposed in this bill, one with little clear purpose or guardrails, will create negative and unintended consequences for Montgomery County's businesses and overall regional competitiveness. And this applies not only to the chain restaurants that are targeted initially in this bill, but for all local business sectors. Montgomery County's business climate is also harmed by having onerous requirements for the business community that do not exist in other competitive, competitive competitive or uh, jurisdictions and markets. What is especially concerning to the Chamber is the future direction of such a commission as well. While the bill calls for the examination of wages and working conditions in just one industry, the Chamber questions what other business sectors will get drawn into this unelected commission's crosshairs in the future. The bill also seems to the Chamber to be unnecessary. If there are concerns about workplace conditions or wages, the County Executive and this County Council already have the authority to address those directly and do not have to turn to an unelected commission. And as this council is fully aware, there already exist numerous local, state, and federal wage and workplace laws and protections that are already on the books. While businesses look to grow, they seek out a regulatory environment that is fair and competitiveness, businesses need certainty, and they cannot prosper and create jobs in Montgomery County with a continually shifting an uncertain environment where an unelected commission has the power to examine any industry. Uh, for those reasons, the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce implores the council to overwhelmingly reject this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Levine. You still have a few minutes. Did you want to speak on the other or you okay. summarize it? Yeah, good, you good three, afternoon. You have three minutes remaining. Good afternoon, members of the council. Again, Brian Levine with the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce in opposition to Bill 35. 23, we strongly urge the county to reject this bill as well. The chamber and its membership oppose this legislation because it would have a profoundly negative impact on both full-service restaurant operators and restaurant servers as well. 
For restaurants, they continue to face economic challenges to adapt their businesses in the current economic environment. The profit profitability model for restaurants, full service restaurants, is already challenging. This bill would create an entirely new business and profitability model for restaurant operators, including those who sign long term leases in this county, in Montgomery County, with an understanding that they would in be engaged in the long time tipped credit model that already exists. With the elimination of the tip wage, most restaurants would have to consider raising menu prices and imposing service charges on customer checks to cover substantially higher labor costs. And for servers, uh, this bill does not only harm restaurant operators, but servers as well would see their wages significantly reduced, significantly. Simply put, tip restaurant employees make significantly more money under the current tipping system, and it's not even close. With service charges and higher menu prices, customers are extremely unlikely to tip servers on top of those increased costs. Uh, Mr. President, members of the council, for those reasons, the chamber is also in opposition of 3523 and asks you to reject that bill as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levine. Uh, next, Mr. Thompson, and you're speaking about item number seven as well, so you get five minutes total. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the council. I'm Melvin Thompson. I represent the Restaurant Association of Maryland. And we strongly oppose both bills. And I'll start talking first about the tip credit bill, because I have more to say about that legislation. And I will share with you that we did submit written testimony as well. And so we have a lot more detail in that. I'll only summarize some of my comments here. But I think first and foremost, I just want this council to be aware that what you've heard mostly on this tip credit legislation is misinformation, misleading data, and false narratives. That's what the supporters of this bill are trying to sell to this council. And I ask you to reject that. And I want to point out some of the misinformation that you've heard, starting with the fact that servers only make $4 an hour. The law says that servers with their base wage of $4 an hour, plus their tips included, must make at least the full minimum wage, or the employers required by law to make up the difference. So that's absolutely false. And you'll hear from a lot of servers here today who will share with you what they actually make per hour with tips included. The other, the other point that has been shared Actually, it was shared in the introduction packet. If you look at the introduction packet on page four, at the bottom of page four, it says a 2014 report by the Obama administration found that 84% of restaurants violate wage laws for tipped workers, including failing to make up the difference when tips don't bring the workers up to full minimum wage. That's completely false. We looked at the wage data from the Department of Labor for 2010 through 2012, and there were only four restaurants during that period in Montgomery County that were full-service restaurants that had violations related to the minimum wage. Just four. And this information would lead you to believe that 84% of restaurants are not in compliance. It's in the introduction packet. False. There's also a list being circulated by the supporters on this issue that claims that there are about 20 restaurants in Montgomery County who pay above the base wage of $4 an hour and actually pay their servers more than what they refer to as a sub-minimum wage. That's also false. We contacted a lot of those restaurants and most of them told us that they actually do utilize the tip credit and they were actually a little disappointed that their names were being used on a list to push a policy with which they disagreed. So it's important for that to be clarified as well. And we have one of those restaurant owners in the audience tonight, and she will be this afternoon, I'm sorry, testifying on this issue. Advocates also say that if you don't pass this bill, servers in Montgomery County will go to DC where they can earn more because DC is spacing out the tip credit there. That's also false. Actually, the very opposite is happening. DC servers are coming into Bethesda and Silver Spring because they're earning less tips in DC because of service charges and higher menu prices and employers are also cutting back on their hours there because of the huge labor cost increase phasing out the tip credit causes. And the reason why this is happening is because restaurants operate on a very narrow profit margin, generally about three to five percent. And so in order to absorb quadrupling their labor costs for servers, 
They can raise menu prices, which they don't want to do because it drives away customers. They can impose a service charge, which some of them are doing now. But what happens when you impose a service charge is servers are going to earn less tips, and that's why they're here today. Because most customers will not tip on top of a service charge. That's what's happening in D.C. right now. Or they could cut hours to cut back on their labor costs, and some of those restaurants in D.C. are doing that right now. And you may notice that there are a lot of servers in the room today in green t-shirts who will speak on this bill and they will mention to you where they work you will also have some who say that they work in restaurants in pink t-shirts who may be reluctant to tell you where they work not the green t-shirts they're actually proud of it and they will tell you where they work here today This legislation is being pushed by an out-of-state organization that has a national agenda. And we think that you should listen to the local employees and the local business owners, uh, just as they did last week in Prince George's County when they decided not to move forward with similar legislation there. They made the right decision, and I hope you'll do the same. And we are also, in my last 10 seconds, opposing the wage commission bill, because this council doesn't really need a wage commission. You already have a very open, fair legislative process that is tried and true. And this would create a wage commission of unelected, unaccountable people um, that we think would be used by proponents to push misinformation, misleading data, and false narratives just as we're seeing on this tip credit legislation. We urge you to reject both bills. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Next, Mr. Uh, Ms. Rohrer. Council President Glass, Vice President Freitz, and honorable members of the council, good afternoon. My name is Amy Rohrer. I am here testifying on behalf of the Maryland Hotel Lodging Association in opposition to Council Bill 3423. Our members include more than 20 hotels with over 4,400 rooms in Montgomery County. While hotels are not specifically named in the Wage Commission bill before you, we are concerned by the slippery slope proposed in the bill. We believe any industry could be caught in the crosshairs as the Wage Commission sets its next annual work plan. We oppose this bill for three main reasons. Our written testimony outlines a multitude of workplace protections already in place that employers must comply with. They include many layers of federal, state, and local regulations and safety standards, often overlapping, that have been enacted through appropriate legislative and regulatory channels with opportunity for input by all stakeholders. For this reason, we also feel the bill before you simply isn't necessary. Secondly, the proposed Wage Commission raises a number of logistical questions and concerns such as what data would be obtained and how would the commission ensure the quality of the data? Uh, how would adequate representation and input on behalf of all segments of an industry being studied be obtained, especially considering there would only be two industry representatives on this commission of seven? And how would the commission obtain data to study wages which are confidential? What is the definition of working conditions and what working conditions beyond those already subject to regulation would be studied? We have many questions and concerns about how the proposed commission would effectively and fairly carry out their duties. And third, we believe business owners and operators, not an unelected board, should be empowered to make wage, working condition, and benefit decisions without the government overreach proposed in this bill. If the council were to enact recommendations made by an unelected wage commission, we believe it would lessen the ability for Montgomery County businesses to compete and grow. Hotels desire partnership with Montgomery County elected officials and government agencies. There's a direct correlation between the success of our industry and the success of Montgomery County and the state of Maryland as we create jobs and generate significant tax revenue. 14 million in lodging tax alone was generated in Montgomery County last year. We also support additional revenue and jobs outside of hotels, given the residual effects that hospitality and tourism brings to the community. In summary, Montgomery County's business operators, who know their employees best and already comply with considerable mandates, 
deserve to maintain independence to effectively run their businesses for the benefit of their individual employees and surrounding communities. Thank you for hearing this testimony. We respectfully request an unfavorable report on CB 3423. Thank you, Ms. Rohr. Uh, thank you to all three of you for joining us this afternoon. We now have two people who are joining us virtually. Uh, first is Christopher Meyer, who is also speaking to item number seven. So, Mr. Meyer, you have five minutes. Thank you, President Glass, members of the County Council. My name is Christopher Meyer. I'm a research analyst at the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that works to build broadly and equitably shared prosperity in every part of Maryland. We strongly support bills 3423 and 3523 because they will help ensure that Montgomery County's labor market delivers fair wages for all workers. First, I'll briefly touch on bill 3423. Uh, as is very clear from both the bill itself and the remarks we've heard so far, the Wage Commission proposed in Bill 3423 would act in an advisory capacity only, similar to many other commissions that advise on a wide range of policy domains. Uh, it would have a balanced membership with representation from business, labor, and the public, which would also allow for co collaborative problem solving. Uh, and it would allow uh, data-informed uh, advice to the County Council on wages. Uh, there are really good, imperfect data available on wages uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Census Bureau, the State Department of Labor. I'm sure that the Montgomery County government also collects data. Uh, there is a large body of very high quality data on wages available. Uh, there are also well-established definitions of working conditions. Um, establishing a, wa a wage commission would uh, improve Montgomery County's economy and ensure that it works for all. Uh, moving on to bit 523. Uh, first, I wanna emphasize that today's speaker list may leave council members with an inaccurate impression of who supports and who opposes one fair wage with tips on top. Hundreds of tipped workers in Montgomery County have signed petitions calling for one fair wage, many of whom are here today. Uh, unfortunately, my understanding is that these workers were not selected to speak. Data is my specialty, but it's no substitute for the lived experience of the tipped workers for supporting Bill 3523. Guaranteeing full wage protection to tipped employees would raise wages for about 15,000 workers and boost pay by more than $150 million per year once fully phased in. The fact is $4 an hour with tips filling the hole does not add up to anywhere near enough to live on. We have clear evidence that the subminimum wage is not a fair deal for workers. First off, in Maryland in 2022, less than 25% of servers earned more than $19 an hour and less than 25% of bartenders earned more than $20 an hour when you combine base wages and tips. So the fact is, these are not occupations where people are making $25, $30 an hour, typically, even close to typically. Workers in tipped occupations in Montgomery County are three times as likely in, as those in other occupations to have family income below the poverty line, and twice as likely they spend at least half their income on housing. Who works in tipped occupations in Montgomery County? 86 of those workers are at least 20 years old. 85% are workers of color compared to 73% of those in other occupations, uh, including 22% who are Asian American, 20% who are black, and 14% who are Latinx. 65% of workers in tipped occupations are women, and 24% are raising children. Research shows that Bill 3523 would bring long-lasting benefits, like helping families put food on the table, improving infant health, and helping seed in school. Research shows also that the sky will not fall. A large body of high-quality evidence has made clear that raising the minimum wage does not meaningfully affect the number of jobs available. Finally, the statutory requirement that employees that employers fill any hole remaining after tips is wholly inadequate as enforcement relies solely on individual workers who are likely to experience explicit or implied pressure to remain silent. 
even in the best of cases, the backfilling requirement customers in the position of unknowingly tipping the boss. With the first $1,019 in tips during the full time workers' pay period, simply offsetting the employer's responsibility. Tips going to the boss. The right choice is clear. Guaranteed tipped workers a fair wage base with, tip, with tips on top. That's exactly what Bill 3523 would do. Uh, and for these reasons, I'm respectfully, respectfully asking uh, for the county, county council's support. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Meyer. And, and you might not have been listening at the beginning of this conversation when I said that normally in afternoon session we have between five and ten people who testify, and today we're having more than 30. We want to make sure every voice is heard, and that is accurately reflected in those who will be providing testimony today. Uh, the next person who's uh, invited to speak on this is Sally Greenberg, who will be joining us virtually. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Montgomery uh, County Council. I did sign up to testify on both bills, but since I only have three minutes, uh, I would like to uh, focus my attention on uh, 3523, the tipped credit. Um, I am the CEO of the National Consumers League. We're a 124-year-old consumer and worker advocacy organization. And we are pleased today to have the opportunity to support Council Member Jawando's legislation before the Montgomery County Council to raise the minimum wage for tipped workers. This legislation could raise wages for over 15,000 tipped workers in the county. NCL has experienced the impact of this legislation because of the decision by voters in the District of Columbia, where I live, to support Initiative 82 uh, in 2022 through a ballot measure in, in neighboring DC. That initiative passed overwhelmingly and is now lifting tipped workers from the sub-minimum wage to a full minimum wage to be phased in over five years, much like your bill. In fact, uh, reflecting on what we're seeing today in the hearing room, uh, in 2018, the Restaurant Association managed to scare workers that their tips would disappear. Uh, the referendum in 2018 passed anyway, and as you probably know, the City Council overruled the will of the voters, and uh, it didn't go into effect. But four years later, after workers and the public realized that that was just wrong and inaccurate, that this would be the end of tips, um, the the uh, initiative was back on the ballot and it passed overwhelmingly by 76% in the District of Columbia. After Initiative 82 was passed and during its implementation period, DC restaurants attempted to switch to service charge and take that money to use in part, and I emphasize in part for customer tips, which created confusion among DC consumers. That, in turn, led uh, finally to an agreement between the D.C. Attorney General, who sent out warning notes to restaurants not to confuse their customers, uh, and that there was an agreement between the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington and the D.C. Attorney General in which the Restaurant Association agreed to language that every restaurant is required to post on their menu explaining how they're using the service charges. Uh, this enables consumers to have information they need to decide whether to tip on top of the service charge. Um, we are now using that same language from the DC AG's office. As I understand it, there's a parallel bill to clarify service charges, and we believe that Montgomery County is taking the proper steps to avoid the problems that occurred in the district, which appear now to be resolved. Just a moment, if I might, um, a personal experience. I was a waitress at three different restaurants. Uh, in my younger days, and, we, and when you live it, you realize some people tip well, most people tip um, moderately, and many people do not tip at all. So uh, I believe, we believe that all workers deserve a stable and reliable wage, and their livelihoods cannot be left up to the whims of restaurant workers. I'll just end by saying no other industry is allowed to rely on customers to pay the wages of its workers. The restaurant and other tipped wage employers have gotten away with this for decades, not having to pay the full minimum wage. And I'm so pleased to see Montgomery County taking up this issue and hopefully ending that tipped uh, credit practice. Thank Thanks. you so much for your uh, time, and I appreciate Thank the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Greenberg.
Uh, as I noted, the, the a joint Health and Human Services and Economic Development Committee work session is scheduled on this piece of legislation for January 18th. Those wishing to submit comments must do so before the end of business on January 11th. We have no more speakers for this item, so this public hearing is now closed. Uh, next is a public hearing on Bill 3523, County Minimum Wage Tipped Employees. This bill would adjust the calculation of the minimum wage for tipped workers, phase out the tip credit amount under the County Minimum Wage Law, and generally amend the County Minimum Wage Law. A joint Health and Human Services and Economic Development Committee session is scheduled for January 18th. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 11th. We have approximately 29 speakers on this issue. I'll invite the first five to the table, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo, Aaron Droller, Tommy Evans, Edward Fishman, and Spencer Smith. And we will start with Delegate Acevedo. You have three minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Council. For the record, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo, uh, representing District 39, communities of Gaithersburg, Montgomery Village, Germantown, Clarksburg, and Washington Grove. Uh, and I'm here testifying in support of Bill 3523. I want to thank the lead sponsors, Council Members Jawando and Council, uh, Council Member Mink, uh, for bringing uh, this bill forward and really um, bringing uh, a very important discussion that our community uh, should be having, uh, not just about uh, the way that we treat workers, but whether workers are able to survive uh, and live in our county. Uh, and the reason why I'm here today is because I represent a very working class and very diverse district uh, in our county. And I heard a lot from my constituents who having to work in the service and restaurant industry during the pandemic because we were working on unemployment assistance uh, for a lot of uh, our constituents. And what we kept hearing from restaurant workers was not only were they not making enough hours, but they weren't making enough in order to make ends meet. And we know that was the case before the pandemic. The pandemic certainly exacerbated that. Um, and what we're dealing with right now um, is serious income inequality. Folks who are struggling to make ends meet and our county certainly isn't becoming any less uh, affordable or cheaper to live in. And so I'm here today on behalf of my constituents who this bill would benefit. Um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the workers who, quite frankly, would have been here but can't be here because they have to be at their job. They have to ensure that they're making enough hours to uh, provide for themselves and their families. Um, and also because I want to commend this council for, uh, one, having the courage to have this kind of debate because there are a number of us in Annapolis in our state's capital who've been trying to push not only this discussion but legislation on tip uh, wages uh, for workers in our state. We've tried to do that around the minimum wage uh, and there was a lot of discussion around that and I think there were folks on the opposite side who felt that you know this was something that localities should handle and so the fact that Montgomery County is looking at it as something that should be commended and my hope is that we could really provide relief to workers with a one fair wage and moving away from this tip credit tip wages that is really steeped in racial injustice. We know um, that tip wages proliferated after the Civil War because we saw um, uh, really uh, an influx of African American workers into the workplace. And so we can do better. We can send a clear message, not just to the rest of the state, what good policy looks like, but how we care about workers and how we ensure that they're not just able to provide for themselves and their families, but they're able to live in a county that is really becoming increasingly more expensive and people who we should be looking after. So thank you all. And I urge a very um, a favorable report on this legislation um, so that workers have uh, the kind of relief that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Mr. Droller. Uh, good, 
Good afternoon, members of the Montgomery County Council. Uh, my name is Aaron Droller, and I'm a resident of Silver Spring. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on Bill 3523. Uh, I testify today in opposition to the bill. Uh, I am not a server or a restaurateur. You know, I'm not wearing a green shirt or a pink shirt. I'm just a regular resident who enjoys going to restaurants, as I'm sure many of you on the dais do as well. Uh, I believe that tipped employees should be paid fairly for their labor. However, this bill is a solution in search of a problem that does not exist. In Maryland, all tipped em uh, in Maryland, all tipped employees are guaranteed the state minimum wage rate. There is no evidence that evasion of the minimum wage law, uh, evasion of the minimum wage law, is a systemic problem in Montgomery County. To the extent that a few outlier restaurants are evading the law, the Maryland Department of Labor is responsible for ensuring the legal requirement is met. This is not a responsibility for the county government, which should not seek to inject itself into a system that is functioning as the law requires. This bill would result in vastly higher menu prices and dramatic surcharges as we're seeing in real time in the District of Columbia. Out-of-state special interest groups and advocacy organizations in favor of this bill would like you to believe that customers will pay these higher prices on top of generous gratuities. This is a completely unreasonable expectation in the long run. The so-called studies and polls that advocates often cite to this effect are riddled with selection bias and do not account for the long-term behavioral changes that will occur. This bill will eventually eliminate tipping culture in Montgomery County. I think at mid-range and more casual restaurants in particular, customers will eventually balk at paying these higher prices on top of tips. I mean, there's really only so much a person is going to pay for a hamburger or a sushi roll. As a result, customers simply won't go to restaurants as often in order to balance family budgets. Money spent eating out is like the first thing that gets cut when a family is trying to reduce expenditures. This will result in a reduction in server hours, take-home pay, and employment. It will also result in reduced revenues for many restaurants with already slim margins and will induce the local and family-owned restaurants that we all love to take their business elsewhere. Ultimately, it may only be chain restaurants that have the financial resources to withstand the county's hostile business climate. And the COVID-19 pandemic hit the restaurant industry particularly hard, and this council should not seek to add unnecessary burdens while our restaurant economy is still recovering. This bill is heavy-handed and it punishes local restaurateurs, customers, and servers. Prince George's County has wisely declined to go down this path. Montgomery County should as well. Please reject Bill 3523. Thank you for your time and for your service to Montgomery County. Thank you, Mr. Droller. Mr. Evans. All right. Hello, I'm uh, Tommy Evans. I'm the owner of uh, Two Story Chimney Cider Works and Celiac Beer Company. Uh, I live in and have both my businesses in the Agricultural Reserve of Montgomery County. Uh, a little about the businesses. Celiac Beer is the only dedicated gluten-free brewery in Maryland and one of only three on the East Coast. So we draw a lot of people in from their neighboring uh, states and counties. Okay, gluten-free beer and a two-story chimney cider works is one of the largest cideries in Maryland and the annual host of the Maryland State Cider Festival drawing in and upwards of a thousand people every year. Um, this bill would effectively triple my payroll, forcing me to make a lot of unfavorable changes uh, to be able to continue to operate. I would need to increase prices, uh, driving customers away. I'm only five minutes from uh, Carroll County, Howard County, and Frederick County, so it wouldn't be too hard to find a different place to go for a much more affordable product. Um, I use tip credit right now. Uh, my bartenders average around $35 an hour over the course of the year uh, with tips. Um, any small business owner right now will tell you how uh, hard it is to find and keep staff. And um, I have opened in 2019 and I've had zero turnover. I've kept every staff member I've hired and hired more since. Um, and some staff are already been talking if this does go through the potentials of what could happen and driving the extra five minutes away to another place to make better tips. Um, and it'd be devastating to lose some of them right now. Like it is really difficult to find anybody. Um, and this ultimately would drive my customers away. Uh, it would drive employees away. Um, and it would really make the future of my company much more uh, in the air than where it is now. So I'd uh, appreciate if you would uh, reject this bill.
Thank you, Mr. Evans. Um, Ed Fishman. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and to the other members of the council. Um, I'm a, my name is Edward Fishman. I'm a resident here in, in District 4, Kate Stewart's district, um, although previously um, Andrew Friedson's district. Um, uh, I'm testifying today primarily on behalf of Our Revolution, uh, which is a group that has represented uh, over 1,800 activists here and, and 3,000 people on our membership list. Um, we've organized before on behalf of similar legislation and in, in, uh, similar referenda in Washington, D.C., and we were happy to see that passed twice by the voters. So it's a, it's a politically a, a good issue, and I, and I hope you um, respect that, um, that this, there are interests beyond what you're going to hear today. But I also want to say that this is an issue, um, just like the other fights we've had on minimum wage, where you'll hear from businesses, and you are hearing from businesses, and, and lobbies like the Chamber of Commerce and the Restaurant Association, who will always fear monger. And it's not unique to this industry. It, you know, Montgomery County has led, and I want to thank Council Members Juwando and Mink for, for uh, in this case, but we've always led on in Maryland on the minimum wage. And we always get opposition from businesses that say that this is going to drive us out, and it's never true. They, they always adapt. Um, the the argument that we have, um, you know, that this registration would impact businesses' bottom line and somehow also take money away from servers defies common sense. It can't be one. It has to be one or the other. Uh, it can't be both. And um, and we, we submit actually that you know this workers will be um, at won't be adversely impacted. You know, I see in the audience people here wearing suits and, and save our tip signs, and, and it really emphasizes that, in fact, um, tips do not belong to the workers. Um, they are up until the, where the minimum wage, the general minimum wage is saved um, and met. Those tips belong to the businesses, and it's only when they cross that threshold that they go to the workers. And this legislation would, would change that dynamic. It will force workers, employers, to pay the workers the proper business um, minimum wage, and workers will then collect the entirety of their tips. And, and we think that's a better system, better model. Um, the industry has always employed um, people of color and women disproportionately, and, and they also suffer from the largest gap in, in pay. And we think that this change would address that. So we hear people saying that there's no, no problem, and, and that's not true. It's, it goes beyond the industry, but you're going to really reach into, uh, into our community and raise the level of, of pay for people who really deserve it. And so we urge you to support 3523. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fishman. Uh, uh, Spencer Smith. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Spencer Smith. Um, I'm co-owner and with uh, my wife, Liz, of the Four Corners Pub in Silver Spring. And I have to say, my previous speaker right there, I disagree, disagree with mostly what she said. Um, a lot of the uh, thank you. A lot of the bartenders and servers here. If you speak with them, uh, one of their issues that they're worried about is having the tips affected. And sorry, I didn't say before. I'm against this bill. Um, one of the things they're uh, affected, they're worried about getting their tips. A lot of them, a lot of seasoned people that have worked in this industry for years, know what they're usually going to make in a night or an evening or a shift that they work. They have their finances based off it. They, of course, have their rent, their bills, and all that stuff. They're scared of that. Uh, one of the two main reasons that me and my wife are against this bill is that uh, we are afraid of the effects of raising it, of course, the business ourselves. But the main thing is to seasoned professionals that work in this industry, they're scared to lose their tips. That's how they base a lot of their uh, livelihood on. We have a bunch of uh, servers and bartenders that worked at the pub for many years, have been in the industry for many years. Council Member Mink, you know this. Um, numerous uh, handful of them have already stated that with this raise, they would probably quit and try and find another industry. Kevin, for example, uh, or servers. Jocelyn, uh, Sarah, who's been in the industry and won, uh, ran the courthouse for 25 years, uh, is already worried to death about this happening. Uh, the other um, issues that we, of course, uh, are worried about is I noticed that the increase would be $2 every year. When you increase minimum wage, it was 50 cents every year. How are we supposed to work with that when 50 cents, of course, for the bare minimum wage was a good thing. We were totally in support of that. But that was hard to work with, especially during the pandemic. 
two dollars a year is going to affect numerous things in the restaurant. As people have said, cutting hours, uh, it was it minimizing staff, of course, raising prices, uh, surcharges on the check. People are fed up with that. Numerous DC people I've spoken to are. They've spoken about the issues they have every time now with people being like, well, I'm not going to tip now. The restaurants are getting it. The other thing that I don't think people are bringing up is the, the um, difference between front of the house and back of the house. How are you going to explain to someone in the back of the house that works 40, 50 hours when they're making $19, $20 an hour that some 18-year-old is coming on making $15 an hour plus tips and they just started in this industry? The division between the front and back house, of course, is a thing. Of course, we always say we're one cohesive unit, but that would drive so much in the hearts of people in the back house. Why would they go work there? Now, being a small business owner, me and my wife are, of course, fearful for this change because of the increase in costs and that it probably would just harm us and our staff that we care deeply about. So, again, I'm saying please don't do this. If you want to leave it up to the restaurants, do. We have a tip credit that works if you enforce it. Make the tip credit a bare minimum of $20 an hour. That's fine. Most of them make it. Vote no. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you to all five of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, now I'd like to invite five more individuals to provide testimony this afternoon. Uh, Stephanie Helsing, Anil White, Michael Richmond, Erica Payne, and Elena James. We'll start with Ms. Helsing, uh, right in front of the microphone. There's a few there. There you go. Um, council President Glass and esteemed members of the council, my name is Stephanie Helsing and I am President and CEO of the Greater Silver Spring Chamber of Commerce. And despite the color choice um, of my suit today, I am here <laughs> this afternoon to express strong opposition to Bill 3523, the repeal of the ticked worker exemption. The restaurant industry has had a challenging time making up for losses over the last few years. There continue to be negatively impactful hiring challenges, increased costs for supplies and food that have forced restaurants to raise prices to a degree never seen before, coupled with fewer people dining out or not dining out as, in, as frequently. Still struggling under the weight of increased debt due in large part to COVID, passing Bill 3523 would be one more hit that most of the small minority owned restaurants in Silver Spring can't absorb. Please consider the following. Passing this legislation and eliminating the tip credit would be devastating to full service restaurants because restaurant owners would be forced to raise menu prices even further and or impose a mandatory service charge as we've heard before. There is no guarantee that this additional price increase alone would cover the additional cost because prior substantial price increases have already reduced overall customer traffic. This increase in costs affects not only payroll, it adds additional administrative costs, increased taxes, and increase in workers' compensation. The earnings potential of tipped employees would also decrease if the tip credit were eliminated because as we know, most customers do not and will not tip on top of aforementioned service charges. To a person, no one I have discussed this with has expressed any support for making less money. In fact, one restaurant owner who owns two establishments in Montgomery County came to talk to me from his kitchen last Sunday where he's now back at work. He can't afford to replace his cook. And his first statement to me is, why are they doing this to us? Other owners have said they can't afford this legislation and will most likely have to close their doors. This then becomes a much larger issue impacting developers and commercial real estate who are already struggling with unusually high vacancy rates. Further, this legislation is not being requested by any restaurant owner or restaurant employee that I know of in Montgomery County. One Fair Wage, who has requested this legislation, is located in Boston and in my mind has not taken the time to understand how the minimum wage works in Montgomery County. In fact, earlier this year, the Maryland General Assembly considered this legislation pushed by the very same organization that would have eliminated the tip credit, but it failed. Restaurant tipped employees made it abundantly clear that keeping the tip credit and tipping system maximized their earnings. And finally, on October 12th, as referenced earlier, a Prince George's County Council Committee voted to indefinitely table a proposal to end the minimum wage, the, the minimum wage tip credit. 
The council will instead focus on ways to combat wage theft in specific restaurants. This is what we are requesting of Montgomery County Council. If a restaurant employee, in fact, reports earning less than minimum wage, address that employer. Don't legislate an entire industry based on a few bad actors. So for the reasons mentioned above, the Greater Silver Spring Chamber of Commerce urges the council to listen to our local businesses, not an outside entity with another agenda, and reject Bill 3523. Thank you. Sorry for going over. Thank you, Ms. Helsing. Aniel White. Hi, how's everyone doing today? My name is Danielle White and I'm a server at Clyde's and I am one of the marginalized people that everyone keeps talking about. I'm African American, I'm a woman, and I'm a mom. Today I when I first that I <laughs> when I first heard that I was gonna speak here, I went and I did research and I was like, oh my god, all these things. I can talk about, you know, a chef from New York, David Chang, that did, you know, wanted to do tips, you know, service without tips in New York for, for during 2016, but I was like, I don't want everything to be about everyone else. I want it to be about me. So when I was 22 years old, I was working at a really good chain restaurant and I found out I was pregnant and the person that I was mentoring with told me, you're not gonna make it. That's what he told me. I quit that day, I went to a hotel, I started as a banquet server, and within a year I became a bar manager. And you're telling me I'm marginalized. And then reality set in. When my mom kept giving me calls about my son's first steps and my son's first words, I was taken away from my family. So what did I do? I went back to what I knew best. I became a server. And now I'm at every basketball game. I'm at every choir. I'm at everything that my kids do. And I bought a home. And I have a car. And I have all these things. I am not marginalized. I work hard. and. For me, working hard, I reap the, the rewards of my work, my hard work, and I refuse to let someone tell me that I am marginalized and I'm underrepresented and I'm all of these things when I'm not. I'm not, and I refuse to believe that to let my kids believe that I'm marginalized and I'm under, underrepresented. I don't want them to think that them working hard is not going to get them somewhere because someone told them that they were that way. I do apologize. Please don't pass this bill. It's not in favor of anyone. It isn't. I'm going to have to miss those graduations. I'm going to have to miss those dances. I'm going to have to miss those things because I'm going to have to work 10 times more because I'm not going to be making the amount of money. I'm going to have to pick up two or three jobs instead of just having the one job with the flexibility that I can. So please don't pass this. Please don't pass this. Thank you, Ms. White. Uh, Michael Richmond. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Richmond. I'm a resident of Silver Spring, and I am testifying in opposition of Bill 3523, the proposed measure to eliminate the tip credit in Montgomery County. I've worked in the restaurant industry for 19 years, and I work to help restaurants manage costs for the past three. And this isn't my first rodeo. I've been against Initiative 77, Initiative 82, and I'm all too familiar with how disingenuous proponents of removing the tip credit are, so much so that those misleadings are in the actual bill template provided by the council. For starters, those seven states have not eliminated a tip credit. Six of them never had one to begin with, and California hasn't had a tip credit in over 40 years. Hello. That's irrelevant. That is relevant because utilizing a tip credit versus paying the full minimum wage are two different labor models. They are two different restaurant models, and they are not interchangeable. I know this because I've opened and operated both a tipped wage restaurant and a full service, a full wage restaurant. Every restaurant in those states that opens knew they had no tip credit, meaning we have no idea what happens during a full phase out. Saru and One Fair Wage are going around acting like they helped them eliminate the tip credit when in reality, A, she and One Fair Wage had nothing to do with that, and B, she has no idea how a phase out works. The timeline and language is based off of nothing. The second thing I want to address is tips on top. There is no proof that this is happening anywhere. In fact, if you just put a little bit of effort and scratch the surface, you will mo most likely see the opposite. BLS data not only shows bar bartenders in Maryland making more than bartenders in California in tips, but also that California's model has a downward trend towards the minimum wage. Tips on top, also a lie. The third thing is this notion that all restaurant owners are these evil entities. In the documents provided for this bill, you cite a study more than 10 years old talking about 84% of restaurants participating in wage theft. Is that supposed to represent how you feel about owners in Montgomery County? Are you going to accuse four out of the five owners that they are thieves? Are we to believe that Montgomery County is operating at an 84% non-compliance rate? 
laying out a decade-old study and leaving them to the implication is wildly irresponsible. But what happens when you eliminate the tip credit? I'm sure one fair wage told you that with no credit, with, without a tip credit, those big bad owners are now going to share front of house tips with their dishwashers and their cooks. And if they didn't tell you that, it's in the FLSA 2018. So you're literally handing those big bad owners control of all of the tips, either through service charge or tip pooling. Restaurants are not a monolith, and neither are the people who go out to eat. Anybody who thinks they know what's going to happen is pretty much a liar because it's impossible to know. I will, however, say there are some highly unlikely scenarios. When I say some restaurants will close and people will probably lose their job, I get called a fear monger. So does that mean that you think that raising wage, raising wage 300% is going to help restaurants hire more people? No. So then the argument is that raising labor 300% is going to do nothing. It's nothing's going to change. The prescribed scenario is triple your FOH labor and change nothing. I don't fault people for not knowing the ins and outs of restaurant P&L. But at some point, some self-awareness of how ignorant you are to how things run is going to win out. Or maybe not. There's, not. there's so much more to this, and I hope you reconsider and open up a real dialogue without agended parties. I'll leave you with this. In my 20 years managing and operating restaurants, the number one reason I could not get a server or bartender to become a manager was they didn't want to take the pay cut. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richmond. Uh, next, Erica Payne. Turn your microphone on, man. Right. There you go. So my name is Erica Payne. I'm a Chevy Chase resident. I'm an employer here. I'm a graduate of the MBA program at the Wharton School at UPenn, and I'm the founder of an organization called the Patriotic Millionaires. Patriotic Millionaires have members here in D.C. and around the world. We work on three things. We work on the tax system, the wage system, and the distribution of political power, which affects the first two. I hear so much emotion in this room. And that is an, it's important to recognize the emotions that people feel and the fear that someone might feel if they're not gonna be able to make ends meet as a server and if they found their career in that. I was a waitress for probably 15 years of my life. And so I completely understand you don't even care about your paycheck. You walk out either with a wad of money or, you know, with credit cards now, and, 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 and that makes sense. I totally understand that that makes sense to you. The issue is that we are facing the biggest threat this nation has probably ever faced in the form of the likelihood of an authoritarian government taking over either this year or five years from now. We have created a level of inequality in the United States of America that is at 100-year highs. We have structured an economy in a way that guarantees about 40% of our people can't make it. They can't make ends meet. They can't come up with $400 in an emergency. And a driver of that is an industry that employs millions of people who is the only industry in this country where the people who sell the product, deliver the product, process the payment for the product, their payment is it, is it the, the whim of their customer. Yes, the Labor Department can step in, but if you are working a shift and you don't make up to minimum wage and you're a waitress who has kids, are you going to go to your manager and say, hey, you need to make up that money for me or I'm going to report you to the Labor Department? Please. These are things that don't happen. The managers give you the Monday breakfast shift. We live in the richest county, one of the richest counties in this country. And we live in a country that is about to fall apart because we have structured our economy in a way that doesn't deliver for the people. Of course, there are folks here who are more comfortable in the system we have. You all are leaders and you need to look at the system that we should have. It's time to structure an economy so if you go to work, you make a living. And of course, we would want tips on top of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Uh, final, final speaker from this group is uh, Alina James. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the council. My name is Elena James, and I've been a server in and around Montgomery County for the last 20 years. The folks on the other side of this argument will tell you that we deserve one fair wage and that we do not make enough money as tipped employees to support our families. I, for one, can say that is not my truth, and, not, and they do not speak for me or my colleagues. During my time in the food service industry, I have always earned enough money to support myself off of tips alone, whether working full-time or part-time. And I've seen people buy their first car, move out on their own, pay their way through college, and provide a comfortable lifestyle for their families. By eliminating the TIF credit and paying us a minimum wage, you will significantly decrease our earning potential and cripple our ability to maintain our livelihoods. One thing that you must understand is that the restaurant industry is very unique. We are not paid by the hour. We are paid based on the services that we provide. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Long gone are the days of 15% gratuities. The standard is now 18 to 20%. And my Silver Diner co-workers and I earn a median of 22% with many t guests tipping upwards of 25 to 30 percent. Our establishment has been a beacon on Rockville Pike for over 30 years and is this city's version of Cheers, a place you can go where everybody knows your name and guests are treated like a friend and a home away from home. We serve with a smile and genuinely care about our patrons, which is why we make such a good living. This is how I've provided service from the time I started serving at Jasper's back in 20 2005 and have carried that standard of service to every establishment since. It has been my observation that with customer service, you get back what you put out. Those who earn less than average, those who earn less than average provide less than average service. And in my opinion, maybe this isn't the industry for you. Yeah. Now let me explain what that good service equates to. A typical work week is a five, shift, five shifts a week for about seven hours. My colleagues and I walk with an anywhere from $150 to $385 per shift, which is an average of $1,338 a week or $66,900 a year if you factor in a two-week vacation. Mind you, this is only an average as I have seen service and bartenders earn up to six figures and I have never worked in a place that had white linen tablecloths. By imposing a minimum wage, we would be forced to work those same 35 hours and earn only $16.70 an hour, or $584.50 a week before taxes. Put yourselves in our shoes for a moment and imagine. You've been accustomed to making roughly $38 an hour and now have to take a 44% pay cut with your earnings capped at only $28,056 a year. How does that make you feel? How are you going to support your family now? Does this seem fair to you? Would you feel like the individuals who voted in favor of this value you and made the decision with your best interest in mind? Will your guests have that same memorable dining experience? This is the predicament that you will be putting all of us in if you vote to eliminate the tip credit. So I implore you all, please make the right decision and reject this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. James. Thank you to all of you for your testimony this afternoon. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up five more individuals. Uh, Alex McCrimmon, Larry Stafford, Ibrin Eubanks, John Sitrauer, and Stephanie Salvatore. Um, Alex McCrimmon, you have three minutes. Uh, put your right there. Very good. Hello, my name is Alex McCrimmon. I'm a county resident for the last, geez, since 19, 1990. So how many of your years that is? I don't know. I'm not doing the math real well real right now. Um, however, uh, I work at Clyde's Tower Oaks in Rockville. You heard a couple of my employees speak to you. I just got a question. By a show of hands, how many of you all have ever worked in restaurants before? Okay. By a show of hands, how many how many of you guys actually tip? 
Okay. Good. All right. No, that, that, that's a good fundamental start, starting, starting point. Um, I've been in restaurants for, like I said, for about 20 years. I've been serving for the last six. I used to be a restaurant manager for Texas Roadhouse, um, Macaroni Grill, uh, who else, where else? Bugaboo Creek Steakhouse, some of you guys might know that place. Um, so I've been around for a little bit. I've managed and I've served, okay? Uh, I actually used to manage. I was working probably about 50 to 60 hours, probably making between 65 and 70 um, before, before bonuses. You know, we had some, I had some personal issues going on in my life where I had to become a single parent. Couldn't work those hours anymore. So what did I have to do? Had to go wait some tables, okay? In Clyde's right now, I work about 30 hours. I take home between 800 and $1,000 in those 30 hours. So if I were gonna sit there and you know, make minimum, for, to give you an example, um, yesterday I made $300 on my shift. If I was making minimum wage, I would have made $133 before taxes. Who would want to take that kind of pay cut? Would you guys take that pay cut? No. Okay, so understand from our perspective as servers is that minimum wage is already guaranteed here in Montgomery County. You've already heard it several times. It's already guaranteed. To move towards a minimum wage where I have to make the same as somebody that works at McDonald's while, while providing top level service where my tip percentage is around 22 to 23%. I generate thousands of dollars in sales for our restaurant, and I'm compensated for it. What you're asking me to do is go on welfare, to be, a, to be, a, to be basically a, a, a reliant on the system of government to actually supplement my income or get two jobs. So I want you to really think about that before you actually pass this bill. Um, I heard some, from the previous speaker, I heard a lady, she said, well, you know, I worked in the restaurant some years ago, and, you know, some people don't tip at all. There's a lot of people that don't tip. There are a lot of people that don't tip, and it's usually because of socioeconomic issues and things like that. Depending on your area is going to be determinate on what kind of money you make. If you work downtown D.C. in the Navy, Navy Yard, like I used to, tips are rough, very rough. If you work in, uh, in Rockville and in, in North Potomac, tips ain't so rough. <laughs> Just being candid with you guys. You gotta understand what you're doing. If you wanna help servers, give us a tax credit. Say, hey, you know what? You guys didn't make you know, X amount of dollars. We're gonna provide you guys a, ta a tax credit to supplement that income. Mr. But McCurry. don't destroy the, in the industry and have teenagers trying to give your grandmother an outstanding, you know, experience on her 80th birthday. Thank, Mr. Because McCrimmon, it's not going to happen. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Larry Stafford, you have three minutes. You sound like you already are. Please, please. We are respecting everyone's opinions and differences. And the people we're here to hear from are those who are testifying. Mr. Okay. Stafford, you have three minutes. Thank you so much. I'd like to use my time here. My name is Larry Stafford, Jr. I'm the Executive Director of Progressive Maryland, and I'm here today as not only the Executive Director of Progressive Maryland, but a former tip worker and an advocate for the elimination of the tip credit in our county, which would ensure that all tip workers receive the full applicable minimum wage in addition to their rightfully earned tips. First, I want to address the notion that the tip credit is essential for sustaining the restaurant industry. This is absolutely false. Several states and cities, including Washington, D.C., our neighbor, have already abolished the tip credit, and their restaurant sectors continue to flourish. The current system disproportionately benefits restaurant owners at the great expense of their employees, many of whom are barely making ends meet. Secondly, while it's technically true that tip workers must earn at least a minimum wage when tips are included, this statement is deceptive. The responsibility often falls on the workers themselves to report their earnings uh, when they fall short of the minimum wage, and that's a daunting process, exposing them to risk of re employer retaliation. Third, the argument that eliminating the tip credit would lead to the imposition of service charges 
thereby reducing tips is already addressed uh, by separate legislation. So tips should be a bonus for extraordinary service, not a mechanism for employers to evade their responsibility to pay a fair wage. Fourth, the claim that tip employees, particularly servers, are among the highest earners in their industry overlooks bartenders, bussers, and other service staff who are also often paid a tipped wage. These employees often face the volatility and uncertainties associated with tipped income, making their financial stability precarious. Fifth, eradicating the tip credit can result in greater financial stability for employees, which in turn to lower staff turnover, overall improved customer experience, and this can actually be beneficial for the restaurant industry as it has been in other places that have implemented this policy. In conclusion, the restaurant industry has consistently demonstrated its resilience in adapting to various challenges, Arguments that fair wages would destroy restaurants are tactics to maintain an unjust status quo. And I'll just speak from my own experience, like when I was working as a delivery driver from Domino's, which I don't know if there are too many delivery drivers here. In that industry, particularly, it's even more precarious, I would say. Like, customers are a lot less likely to tip at the doors in a lot of cases. And I personally had experienced wage stuff rampant. Like, when you go and try to, like, get, like, when you didn't make enough tips and you try to get that actual minimum wage, you get a lot of pressure from your supervisor, your employer, and it just doesn't make you want to do it ever again. So, yeah, I'd like you to also consider delivery drivers as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stafford. Uh, Mr. Eubanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Montgomery County Council. My name is Jabron Eubanks. I'm the political organizer um, representing 1199 SEIU. Um, we represent over 10,000 members in Maryland and D.C. And I'm here today to support CB 3523 to increase the minimum wage for tip workers. And we're really excited to take this step in demanding one fair wage for tip workers. Um, increasing wages is a lot more than simply putting money in workers' pockets. Um, it's about providing family-sustaining wages. A living wage should mean that one job is enough, and as a tip worker, whether or not you can pay your rent should not be dictated on the kindness of customers or fluctuating tips. 1199 has stood on the front lines to help lead multiple statewide wage campaigns that raise wages for thousands of workers, yet we have not been able to eliminate the sub-minimum wage. It is completely unacceptable to continue to leave these workers behind. When I think about why we have not been able to push this forward, I believe it's because the majority of this workforce are mostly women and women of color who have long been undervalued and underpaid. Here in Montgomery County, we have an opportunity to change that. We commend Council Member Jawando and the County Council um, for their leadership and also the workers who have come out today to voice their concern. We urge a favorable report on this legislation on behalf of tip workers everywhere who are struggling to make ends meet. I um, also just want to add a personal note um, as a consumer standpoint. Um, I frequent D.C. often. Um, I like to hang out and go to restaurants and bars a lot over there. Um, I have a good time. Um, and I will say that I didn't realize until working on this campaign that gratuity and service charges were not going directly toward tip workers. When I would have those conversations with friends and colleagues who I would um, visit with, they were completely unaware as well. I would say over 90% um, had no idea that, that those um, uh, uh, fees weren't going toward tip workers. When I would make them aware of that, we didn't stop tipping. <laughs> we actually were encouraged to tip more. When you realize that that gratuity fee is not going toward the actual tip workers, and then that didn't make us say, you know what, they don't, they don't deserve any tip at all, right? No, we, we tip these workers. So we encourage all consumers as well to do the same. Um, and at the same time, it shouldn't be on the consumer to, um, it, it, it's, it's not our responsibility to ensure that restaurants um, pay, pay fair wages and give benefits to their employees. That's their job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eubanks. John Trower, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for offering me the time to share a firsthand experience with the hospitality industry, something I feel is lacking in many of those attempting to alter the way our industry operates. Uh, these conversations often have people speaking on behalf of restaurant employees instead of listening to them. I would like to offer the perspective of the hourly associate, the person supposedly aided by the interference of lobbyists and elected officials in our work life. The push to eliminate the tipped wage credit is, I believe, coming from a place of both kindness and ignorance. 
To oversee the hospitality industry properly, we have to start with acknowledging a base reality. It is already illegal for workers to make less than the minimum wage. No one is making $4 an hour unless they are being robbed. And if this measure is meant to address wage theft, it is a failure. Instead, this measure uses the false pretense of employees making less than the minimum wage to increase the cost of doing business to untenable levels. I'm not interested in hypothetical scenarios regarding what happens when a labor budget is rapidly tripled. I can assume the cost get passed to consumers with significant backlash just based on experiences with food costs during the recent supply chain issues at the height of the COVID pandemic. We've already seen many restaurants in DC establish service charges to offset the increased overhead, but more relevant to me is the worker experience. And I can share this because I live it. When costs go up and business fails to magically boom, hours are cut. You can offer me $20 an hour, which is still a substantial pay cut, to be honest. But if my hours are slashed, I haven't been helped at all. My perspective seems to be shared by others, as I've seen applicants come in from DC since their tipped wage credit was eradicated. People are coming to my place of work looking for jobs outside the district because their hours have been cut to levels that are unsustainable. This is not theory, it is already happening right now. If you want to combat wage theft, please do. If you want to keep an eye on our industry and protect employees from exploitation, I would welcome that. Shut down establishments that mistreat their workers. I will board up the doors myself, but do not mess with our ability to pay rent or to eat. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Zittrauer. Um, Ms. Salvatore. Hi. Um, my name is Stephanie Salvatore. I've been in the hospitality industry for just over 30 years in Montgomery County. Um, I found out about this bill just a few weeks ago, and so to learn more, I called up to Councilmember Jawando's office to get more information. And after reading the documents that were sent to me, I was really surprised to find that One Fair Wage had publicly listed and falsely publicly listed my two restaurants payment structure in an effort to make us appear aligned with their mission. So I was really concerned and I reached back out to um, Council Member Juwando's office and I put and I was put into contact with um, the president of One Fair Wage and after discussion she said that I would be removed from the list. And at that same time, I did mention to her that I saw other Montgomery County restaurants on that list that likely use the tipped minimum wage. It's important that I tell you that I was never contacted by One Fair Wage um, to ask for my restaurant's information, and it was just incorrectly posted um, for, I guess, their political agenda. Um, I do, however, um, pay my employees the tipped minimum wage plus tips. And on a really slow day, they make the mid-20s. On an average day, it's mid-30s to 40s. And then um, on a high day, on a, on a really good day, I've seen it go as high as $68 per hour. Um, <laughs> my, 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 my restaurants also, we, um, we pool tips. And what that means is that every server at the end of the shift makes the exact same amount of money um, and that goes for my servers and bartenders. Um, so that in our restaurants, that creates community and unity, and it's 100% fair for everyone. Um, I do want to also just mention, I know you all know this, that the makeup wage guarantees every tipped employee will make the minimum wage. Um, so our payroll companies flag that, and you know, if it ever happens. It, it doesn't usually happen. I went back and looked. It happened like twice in, in the last three years in my restaurant. Um, for family-owned businesses like mine with no buying power, food costs have gone up, credit card fees have risen, product availability has wavered, and vendors have added fees to cover the rising costs of fuel. Um, these increases have dramatically reduced already small margins. The I-82 changes in D.C. Um, has, has full service restaurants raising prices and adding service fees to make up for their payroll increase. It's unrealistic to assume that um, a customer is going, is going to be willing to pay an additional 20% tip on top of the service fee. And therefore, servers are often making less than what they would under a traditional tipping policy. Um, there are restaurants in DC that I know of that are not hiring anymore, but they are testing tablets and robots. I have a video if anybody wants to see the robot. Um, my son's girlfriend left her server position in DC because her tip average dramatically dropped 
and she skipped over Montgomery County because she knew we were gonna we were gonna be here today but she's since found employment as a server in Virginia um, Miss Salvatore you yes. can you wrap up oh yeah I'm so sorry um, I just I just hope that um, you understand that we're not interested in replacing our employees to generate re more revenue with tablets and we are all in green here, the local people and families who live and work in Montgomery County. And just last, really quick, I, as a server, I put my husband through culinary school and we worked really hard and we saved our money and I was able to open a restaurant. And 25 years later, I just sold that restaurant to, two tip, to my two long-term tipped employees that are here with us today. Um, and they were both servers and they now yes. own... Thank you, Ms. Salvatore, for your I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. We have a number more people to go to. Thank, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to invite four individuals up. Uh, Tavis Waters, Tamara Aguilera, Mikey Nab, and Federico Orego. Tavis Waters here in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, committed to race and gender equity in our industry. I want to share some comments from a restaurant owner from here in Montgomery County. Uh, my name is Bradley Williams, owner of Bistro 64 in Montgomery County. Many restaurants, such as my own, have been raising wages to recruit staff, but the industry cannot be saved by raising wages one establishment at a time. There needs to be reform across the industry statewide. I have found that wage increases have helped with staffing recruitment, but we cannot do it alone. We need policy that will end the subminimum wage for tipped workers. Ending subminimum wages would signal to millions of workers in Maryland uh, to come back to work because the wage increases will be permanent and that it's worth coming back to the industry. Those are Bradley's comments. I, I just want to say I've heard some comments earlier about people not being willing to say where they work. I'm very proud to tell you where I have worked and where I work now. I started as a dishwasher when I was 15 years old at TGI Fridays. I worked every position in the back of the house until I was told I was bad at all of them and kicked out to the front of the house, to the front of the house where I have worked every position in the front of the house from buster, food runner, host, uh, server, barback, bartender, and eventually owner. I've owned three restaurants of my own. I earned the money to open those restaurants through tips in states where there is no subminimum wage. So tips do not go away. Uh, we do have a national agenda, helping ensure a resilient industry where all can thrive together, owners and workers, like what I have experienced myself. There is success and consistency where I'm from. Tipped workers make $40 plus an hour. At my restaurants, there were times when workers made $75 an hour. Uh, it's very successful in the seven states that have one fair wage. They're not all chain restaurants. They're not extremely limited hours. There's no robots instead of servers. There is also a recent example of transitioning to one fair wage from subminimum wages. Flagstaff, Arizona has done it. It's in the last year of its scale up and restaurants there are thriving and tips are high. I understand that it's scary, especially when people tell you that they want to stop allowing tips and institute service chargers that the owners will keep. Service chargers in restaurants in the seven states are rare and almost always go straight to workers. Um, there are five years of scaling up wages, so when you hear quadruple front of the house labor costs, that's a little misleading too. Owners will raise prices when the cost of anything else goes up, for, but for workers, could this never be possible? Um, Restaurant owners are creative and entrepreneurial and resilient, and we can figure this out, just like we figure out how to price menus when avocados cost $2 each. I promise it's possible, and the restaurant industries in the seven states are proof that it works. You don't ask your bartender in San Francisco, Seattle, or Las Vegas how much they make an hour before you tip. Um, I have more to say, but my time is up, so I'll just say that's what we mean when we say one fair wage with tips on top. We're raising the floor. We're not lowering the ceiling. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nam. Mr. Orega, Orego. Good afternoon, Montgomery County Council members. Uh, my name is Federico Rego. I've been a server for the last 25 years, and the last 15 years I've been working at this French bistro located in the heart of Bethesda called Mon Amigadi. I have been able to provide and support my family doing this job, but I may not be able to do so anymore with this new bill uh, that is sponsored by council members uh, Jaguando and Mink. 
as I read the new proposal, it seems like a very well-intended but not too well-informed one, which makes me wonder if council members, uh, Jaguando and Ming, ever had the opportunity to work as servers. And if they did, uh, something tells me they already forgot how the whole system works. Because I get, uh, because the tip of the tip credit, I get paid $4.40 an hour with tips on top of that, brings my uh, hourly rate close to $30 an hour. This is why rest the restaurant, my restaurant can afford to let me work the extra hours, extra shifts. So let's do the math. If I make $30 an hour, and this proposal is trying to bring it down to $16.70, I'm looking at a $13.30 pay cut hourly, which is more than 45% cut of my original income in hours alone. Since the restaurant won't be able to afford uh, letting me work the overtime that I usually work, which only translates to extra income for me, that means I'm looking at a higher percentage cut, up to 55% pay cut. How is that going to work for me and my family's favor? We already know that once people know that I'm making $16.70 an hour, they're not going to tip on top of that, which is exactly what's happening in D.C. right now, and we all know it. This means I will have to do some critical cut expenses in my household, like health insurance probably. I'm sure everyone in this room knows how expensive health insurance is, right? With this new bill, the health insurance that I have right now, I won't be able to afford the $750 a month that I pay for it. Uh, I'm going to have to get cheaper health insurance with less coverage for me, my wife, and my son. A cheaper health insurance is going to result in bigger copay that is also going to be harder to afford with the 50-55% less income. I'm probably going to have to cut my 401k because that's another big chunk of my check. Because when I retire, I don't want to depend on Social Security checks alone. I'm sure you people sitting at that table feel the same way. It feels good knowing that when you're old and ready to retire, you're going to have the safety net that you built up throughout your career. Well, I won't be able to have the safety net no more, thanks to your once again very well-intended but not too well-informed proposal. A few weeks ago, my general Meyer, a manager told me how uh, the executive, uh, Montgomery County Executive Mark Eric, I uh, was in a meeting with him and some other managers from the Bethesda and Rockville area discussing this bill. And when they confronted him about it, he had the audacity to simply say, and I quote, just raise the prices and make the burgers $30. I always go to D.C. and order $30 burgers and I still tip on top of that, end of quote. I don't think he realizes that not everyone has the same privileges that he and everyone sitting at this council table have. So please work for us, not against us. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Orego. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Now I'd like to invite down uh, Fekka Madhu and Chris Shand. First is uh, Fekak Mandu. Perfect. Thank you so much. I just want to see my three minutes to a former, my friend, a former. Good afternoon, President, Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Ifoma Izimako, and I've had 10 plus years uh, experience in the restaurant industry here in Maryland. Um, I'm gonna cut quick to the chase. Nobody can budget to feed their families on $2.13 an hour. Nobody can budget to feed their families based just off of tips. You can go with your average of whatever you've made from before, but you cannot tell me how much you're going to make tomorrow. Providing a full minimum wage plus tips on top is not going to take away the tips Customers don't come in and ask how much we're made, how much we're being paid, and it's also not their responsibility to pay us. During the pandemic, a lot of people couldn't afford to. So just because the employers want a legal way of skipping out on paying their employees and passing it off to the customers, that's not fair to us workers. I want to be, I'm in my 20s, I want to be able to budget, save, especially with prices going up. I want to be able to know, okay, this is how much I'm walking home with, a paycheck. 
that I can actually budget, not based off of the kindness of somebody that has walked into the that has walked into the restaurant. I enjoy being in the service industry. I enjoy helping others, but I also want to be paid a full minimum wage plus tips on top. You can tip anybody. I can tip you right now for ho for holding the door for me. That's not going to change the culture just because I'm being paid what I'm supposed to be paid by my employer. I will also want to add that there's a lot of misinformation being spread. A lot of the people in the green shirts, they're blindly following whatever their employee, their employer is telling them. And coming from a worker, I do understand that because I don't want to face retaliation. When I first learned that, hey, I was making a sub minimum wage, did I want to walk up to my boss's office and be like, hey, you're supposed to pay me a full minimum wage? Yeah, but did I want to get fired? No. Putting in a policy that stretches out all across the board. Okay, you can go to, uh, what did he say, Clyde's? They get paid however much in tips. Okay, what about the person that doesn't? What about the next person? I thank you guys for being leaders in our community to set a, a standard, a bar, of how much people should get paid so that you don't have to enforce wage theft or so you don't have to go through with the compliance of, okay, let's, let's do prevent, preventative measures, not treatment. That's uh, my standpoint. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chris Shand, you have three minutes. Thank you, Council President and the rest of the council members. I appreciate your time with us today and your willingness to listen. We've provided uh, testimony written to all of the council members, and we appreciate you taking the opportunity to listen and learn. Um, there's a lot of talk about sub-minimum wage, the rhetoric that's been shared and profitized by one fair wage. There is no sub-minimum wage. Everyone has to make minimum wage. It's the law, period. So the idea that there is wage theft was addressed in the minimum wage fight years ago uh, here with Montgomery County. You put in steps to ensure that there's pay transparency, that people can look at their paychecks and see exactly how much they earn per hour. The minimum wage per hour, the, the tipped wage per hour against their labor hours. It's all on their pay stubs. You've heard from a lot of our folks. You've heard a lot from our own team. We have well over 380 employees in, the, in Montgomery County. We also have an, a restaurant in Navy Yard where one of, one of the servers pointed out, not our server, but another server, pointed out tips aren't as good there. We've provided proof that tips aren't as good there. That's very true. They average 18%. Since putting in the tipped credit elimination, first phase, first phase, there's two more phases to go. We've seen payroll costs jump out $7,000. But you want to know what's more important? We've seen employee tips drop 2% straight off the board. $22,000 less and an increased cost to us at $7,000. So, and a 20% drop overall in sales. We get competitors come to us, we get competitors' guests because they don't want to pay the service charges that our competitors have put into place. They're looking at it, and there is this fallacy. Tips on top don't exist. We're not seeing that. It doesn't happen. So when you look at the very real cost, guests are unhappy. Our servers become unhappy. It's a, it's, we're, we're trying to do something here. You're trying to help someone that doesn't need help. Our servers are making great income. There's nothing wrong with the income that they make. They make trem tremendous income based on the tip model that has worked and served for this industry for so well. So the rhetoric of sub-minimum sub wage and the rhetoric of, that surrounds all of the other thing that one fair wage profligates is really just unfair. And it's not representative of our industry. And we are proof. We're a local group, and we're proof. You can look at our numbers. We're happy to share them. You can see exactly what happens in D.C. with the increase. 
I appreciate you all taking the time to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sands. Thank you. Um, there are three more individuals who will be testifying virtually. Uh, and so first I'd like to invite Jackie Greenbaum. Hi. Uh, hi, Evan. Thank you to the members of the council for allowing me to speak today. Um, right. My name is Jackie Greenbaum, and I'm here to register my objection to the measure before you to eliminate the tip wage in Montgomery County. I own the well-known Quarry House Tavern in downtown Silver Spring uh, and recently opened Charlie Prime Foods in Gaithersburg, just named one of the top 40 area restaurants by the Washington Post. One of the reasons I returned to the county after many years was because the tip wage still exists here. It helps reduce restaurants' operational costs, thereby mitigating the enormous risks involved in opening a new restaurant. More to the point, I also own three restaurants in Washington, D.C., which has just begun the transition from the tip wage to the D.C. minimum wage, which is the highest in the nation. This transition is wreaking havoc in D.C. for both restaurants and diners. I'm here to implore you to please wait. Wait until we see what happens in D.C. The first increase from just $5 to $8 has left us reeling like we're at the brink of disaster. Uh, this one raise cost our restaurants over $2,000 per week per restaurant, and we're headed to $17. We're all pretty much freaking out and without a clear strategy on how to make up this cost. After a lot of hand wringing, we added a small service charge to make ends meet for now, but it's just a Band-Aid. We're all worried we'll lose staff. They are unhappy about the change. Most didn't support the law and don't understand the new pay formulas. We're worried about con uh, customer pushback resulting in decreased sales volume. We feel catastrophe looming, and speaking for myself, I do not think that my three restaurants will be left standing at the other side of this. The argument to end the tip wage hinges upon the claim that customers will gladly pay higher prices or mandatory service charges if they know the surfers are making a higher guaranteed wage. Yet we're seeing this as a fallacy. Service charges and increased prices are not being accepted. DC diners are screaming bloody murder as we begin to implement measures to cover the new labor costs. Read the comments on any article or on DC's, any article on DC's new wave of service charges to hear the vicious complaints about new pricing. Yesterday's DC Eater Magazine's headline was, the era of the $44 salad has arrived, and this is our future. One last point, and this is also key. So far, workers are not better off under the new non-tipping systems we're being forced to employ, and there's mounting evidence their income decreases. We certainly cannot compete with the $33 to $40 an hour our TIP employees currently make under any new compensation model we'll need to adopt to meet these new costs. Be prudent and wait. Wait until we see this play out in D.C. and we understand the full ramifications. Wait for D.C. to show the way or expose the hazards and pitfalls so they can be met head on or avoided. Use this opportunity to watch, learn, game plan, and most importantly, make a fully informed decision, not based on conjecture, but on the real life experience of your closest neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Saru Jayaraman. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, it's a little faint. I'll look at my team if we can increase the volume on our end. Is that better? That is much me? better. Thank you. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My name is Sarah J. Rahman. I'm the co-founder and president of One Fair Wage. Uh, we've been fighting for this for two decades, and I'm here on behalf of 474 Montgomery County tipped workers who have signed petitions calling for a full minimum wage with tips on top. Happy to deliver those petitions to you. We already have, and we'll share those names. Uh, I'm also here on behalf of a coalition that includes, as you heard, SEIU 1199, uh, many other groups in, that you've already heard from, but I, I do want to mention CASA Maryland is here in full force and did not get chosen to speak. We had 33 people signed up to speak today. Um, none of the Montgomery County workers who signed up in favor were chosen. They were all rejected, which is why we had to have Mom do have a FOMA speak for him. And we were told that this would be set up with two-thirds op opposed and one-third in favor, which we didn't quite understand. Um, but I do want to say there are hundreds of tipped workers in Montgomery County that support this. 
uh, and some that were, are there today and weren't allowed to speak. The subminimum wage for tipped workers is a direct legacy of slavery. It was created after emancipation to allow restaurants the ability to hire newly freed black people, black women in particular, not pay them and force them to live on a new thing that had just come from Europe at the time called tips. After emancipation, the Restaurant Association, the National Restaurant Association, which is now an $80 million organization that funds and has created the Maryland Restaurant Association, uh, has been fighting for 100 years to maintain this sub-minimum wage for tipped workers. Now, as you've heard, some workers do make a lot of money in tips, and that's wonderful for them, but the median wage in Maryland for tipped workers is under $20,000 a year. And if you don't believe that, that's, by the way, employer-reported data. I think it's important to look at Montgomery County SNAP benefits usage. Tipped workers use SNAP benefits in Montgomery County at nearly double the rate of all other workers. So most workers are women, women of color, who do not make enough. And meanwhile, as you've heard, there are seven states where we've done quintile research, meaning the top tip earners to the lowest tip earners at every level, they are making more money in tips and wages in California and the seven states that do this than they are in Maryland. The National Restaurant Association launched Save Our Tips as a PAC in 2018. John Oliver called it out as a fake corporate created AstroTurf PAC back then on his show. Um, the law does say that employers have to make sure that tips bring you up, but the U it was the Obama administration actually that found an 84% violation rate and found it unenforceable. The issue is that workers, especially the most vulnerable workers, as you heard, cannot go report that they're not making enough in tips. And that is precisely, that is precisely why when employers like the one you heard from post on Indeed.com, which is where our data came from, it wasn't a list of people who support, it was a list of people who posted on Indeed.com saying you will get 20 or 25. And then the worker shows up and maybe they get that sometimes, they don't get it other times. That is precisely why we need the transparency and standardization of a full minimum wage with tips on top. Listen, there are a lot of workers in the room who are there with their employers and can say the name of their restaurants because their employers are there. There are other workers in the room who cannot because their employers do not support this and they are doing this with great courage and risk. And that is who we are asking you to stand up for, the vast majority of tipped workers who cannot speak up because their employers do not support this, but desperately need this. Thank you. Equity Thank you, Ms. J. Rahman, for your testimony this afternoon. I provided you with more than three minutes, as I have with many people here, and we expanded the list multiple times and took people off the wait list. So thank you very much. The last person who will be providing testimony this afternoon is Diana Ramirez. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Diana Ramirez with the National Women's Law Center. We represent women all over the country, and we're based in D.C. We're just a year ago, voters overwhelmingly decided to abolish the shamefully low subminimum wage for tipped workers. They decided that employers shouldn't be able to get away with paying tipped workers just a few dollars an hour while customers pay the rest. They decided to end the racist, sexist policy that left tip workers in D.C., most of whom are women and people of color, facing rates of poverty and sexual harassment at two or three times the rate of workers in other jobs. They decided that having one fair minimum wage for everyone would be good for workers and consumers, good for business, and simply the right thing to do. This council has an opportunity to make the same decision. The one fair wage bill before you will require employers to pay tipped employees no less than the full minimum wage with tips on top by 2028. As you know, employers in Montgomery County currently can pay tipped workers just $4 an hour before tips. With those wages in this economy, it should come as no surprise that many workers have left tip jobs and many who remain question whether they should stay in a profession that leaves them vulnerable to harassment and scrambling to pay their bills. Meanwhile, in D.C., the tip minimum wage is $8 an hour and on the rise. It will go up each year until it matches the full minimum wage in 2027. If Montgomery County does not do the same, employers here will see an exodus of workers seeking better pay in the District of Columbia. Of course, you're also hearing today that this bill will burden employers and harm Montgomery County's economy. When the National Restaurant Association has worked to keep the federal tip minimum wage at just $2 or 30 cents an hour for more than 30 years. It's no surprise to see it band together with the local industry to keep wages low here too. 
But what they're telling you simply isn't true. Nothing in the one fair wage policy being considered eliminates tips. Nothing in the policy requires restaurants to impose service charges. There are restaurant owners just a few miles away in DC who are implementing these changes without adopting service charges. And it's not just DC, as mentioned, Chicago just passed this policy a few days ago. Adopting one fair wage in Montgomery County will ensure the tip workers can count on a paycheck when they have a slow night or a slow week. It can help close the wage gap because it will essentially boost wages for women. It will help tip workers and their families thrive, and it will help the restaurant industry thrive too. We urge council members to support this critical legislation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I wanna, uh, on behalf of all my colleagues, thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, many of you are here unpaid. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts and testimony with us today. Uh, and as I noted, a Joint Health and Human Services and Economic Development Committee work session is scheduled for January 18th. And those wishing to submit testimony for the council's consideration should send it to us by the close of business on January 11th. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. We have other work to do, so please be quiet as you exit. And be respectful as you exit. Okay, we are now moving on to item number eight, which is a public hearing on expedited. Folks, I'm going to ask you to please be quiet as you exit. We still have more work to do here. Item number eight is a public hearing on expedited bill 3723 contracts and procurement minority owned businesses sunset date amendments. This bill would extend the sunset date for the county's minority owned business purchasing program and generally amend the law regarding procurement. A government operations and fiscal policy committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Those wishing to submit testimony for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on October 26th. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next, item number nine is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation 2421 to the FY24 operating budget for the Montgomery County Department of Police, the drone as first responder pilot program for the amount of $350,000. The source of funds are general funds undesignated reserve. Um, uh, joint public safety and government operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for October 18th, and those wishing to submit materials for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. Uh, you might have heard something that I just mentioned regarding the committee work session, uh, and I want to share with everybody the council's new position. 
regarding special appropriations that are sent over by the county executive in an off budget cycle that use general funds. Uh, we spend uh, weeks and weeks to develop the county's budget. Uh, as was evident earlier this year, a $6.7 billion budget. And the time it takes is uh, a laborious one for everybody. Uh, but we want to make sure that we are good stewards to the taxpayers of Montgomery County. So the council at our most recent retreat about three weeks ago uh, agreed to a new process for special appropriations when they are sent over outside of the budget and when they use general funds. And that new procedure is to hold a public hearing on that item and then to have it be sent to the fiscal Pol government operations and fiscal policy committee and the committee of jurisdiction. So for this particular project, for this particular uh, budget priority, it will be sent over to the government operations and fiscal policy, policy committee and the public safety committee. Depending on what that joint committee proposes, it will then come back to the full council and it will not go on the consent calendar. It will be a standalone vote to ensure greater oversight and transparency and use of taxpayer dollars. That is the council's agreed upon process. This is the first special or supplemental appropriation that we are adhering to that process. And so with that, we have a number of people who would like to testify. Uh, I would like to invite up Captain Jason Kokonis, Stephen Mech. Mechelstein, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> You're used to that. Paul Holmes, Tim, Tim Pruss, and Richard Hoy. Uh, and then also, uh, let's invite up um, Herman Alvalero as well, so everybody who's in person will be able to be at the table at the same time. And we'll start with you, Captain. You have three minutes. Did a mic check. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Captain Jason Kokinos from the Montgomery County Police Department, and I'm here to provide uh, testimony in support of the Drone as First Responder Pilot Program, which I'll refer to as DFR. As everyone is aware, MCPD is facing staffing shortages and enduring ongoing recruitment challenges. At the same time, we must continue our mission to provide the highest quality police services to our community. We need to leverage technology and stay cutting edge to assist us in being more efficient and effective. The DFR program is one way to do that. MCPD has been successfully using unmanned aircraft systems since 2020 under an existing program, but this pilot program would be different from what we have been doing previously. DFR involves sending a UAS to a 911 or police generated call for service with the UAS arriving on the scene prior to or in conjunction with officers on the ground. Our goals with this program would be to improve response times to emergencies, provide information to officers for better decision making and to increase de-escalation opportunities, helping crime victims by aiding and locating criminal offenders and to allow us to be more efficient by potentially avoiding the need for ground officers to continue response to certain events, which would then free those officers for other tasks. The DFR program is designed for the response only to 911 or police generated calls for service. This is not a program of surveillance or proactive patrol. Because of the type of airspace that we operate in, we work very closely with the FAA and TSA who oversee and approve our flight operations. What we are asking to do is simply pilot this program to see if it works for our community. DFR has been in use in Chula Vista, California since 2018 and has a five-year proven track record of success there. Multiple other cities in California, such as Santa Monica and Beverly Hills, also have established DFR programs. MCPD has been carefully researching this program for over a year, and we were fortunate to travel to California to see this program firsthand. We were able to see live examples of de-escalation, the use of DFR to prevent unnecessary police contact with members of the public, and the efficiency of freeing up ground officers to respond to other emergencies. 
We see, see a real potential for this program to benefit everyone in our community and enhance public safety for all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Meckelsethian, thank you. My name is Steve Meckelsethian. Uh, and turn your microphone on. Okay. So we can all hear the excellent pronunciation. Hello? There we go. There we go. Hello, my name is Steve Meckelsethian. I'm a 70, sorry? I should know this, I'm in sound. But <laughs> Hello, my name is Steve Meckelsethian. I'm a 73-year-old Bethesda homeowner, still working full-time with my wife and son in a small business I started 47 years ago. I'm here today representing the Montgomery County branch of the Democratic Socialists of America. Our group is proud to be an active partner in the Silver Spring Justice Coalition. We are in opposition to the proposed pilot drone pro program unless civil liberty safeguards are established as enforceable county regulations with penalties for violations. We also view community and council oversight of the drone program as essential. I propose that a drone program oversight committee be established, staffed with community members, and I volunteer. Okay, uh, oversight means that our committee designees and council folks should have the right to see the drone footage upon request to determine if county regulations and applicable laws are being respected. The timeline between the August and September MCPD public meetings about the drone program and the issuance of MP, uh, MCPD's updated drone policy was very short. The final public meeting was in Wheaton on September 12th. The policy directive materialized just seven days later on September 19th. That's not enough time, nor enough meetings for meaningful community engagement. I have a number of concerns about the language and stated policies of the directive. On the first page under policy B, recording is prohibited where a person would have a reasonable expectation of privacy, except in emergency situations. This is overly broad and needs a specific definition. Page three under procedures, tactical deployment. The term terrorist activities needs to be defined. Police have sometimes carelessly used the word terrorist to vilify Black Lives Matter, environmental, anti-war, and other peaceful protesters protected by the First Amendment. The result has been inappropriate use of force by police and even deadly vigilante violence. Also, page three procedures. The visual perspective clause is overly broad. It seems to allow the police to use drone surveillance for just about any reason. Take it out. Page four under procedures for UAS use. Subsection six, strike the word should. Replace it with must include information regarding the reason for drone deployment and all other vital information included in that clause. We were told that this info would be available to the public on a public website the next day, so it's important that it be done diligently every time. Page five, restrictions, states that collection of data shall not be based solely on individual characteristics, such as race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, and so forth, or to identify persons participating in lawful First Amendment protected activities. Strike the word solely as it weakens the protection promised. I have more concerns about the program. You'll find most of them on the written statement submitted by SSJC. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. Uh, Paul Holmes. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Paul Holmes, and I live in the Forest Knowles neighborhood of Silver Spring, one of the intended drone surveillance areas. I am testifying in opposition to the special appropriation on behalf of the Silver Spring Justice Coalition. SSJC opposed a similar funding request during the FY24 budget hearings. We continue to object to any expanded use of drones and ask the council to impose significant safeguards and their, on their use moving forward. Paramount is the creation of a commission composed of community members, privacy experts, and criminal law practitioners to provide guidance on the development of method two regulations similar to what exists in San Francisco. We cannot rely on the internal MCD policies alone. Involvement and oversight by the council and the community is critical because the use of drones by law enforcement implicates significant policy interests and can be used in a number of harmful ways, particularly against communities of color. We discuss a number of these concerns and the need for method two regulations in our written testimony, and I want to highlight just a few here. First, 
Paul, the policy appears to restrict the use of drones based on certain prohibited criteria, such as monitoring First Amendment activities. Further clarification of these safeguards is urgently needed. Second, the policy does not mention the promised website that would contain daily updates documenting every time a drone is used, nor does it make data, doc, data collection mandatory. Third, the policy does not reflect MCPD's promise that drone cameras will face skyward while en route to a call for service, and it does nothing to prevent MCPD from targeting someone who was not the subject of the initial call for service. The absence of any limitations on MCPD's ability to sweep in other people while sending out drones to neighborhoods that are already over-policed is one of many concerns we have with their policy and this program as a whole. As technology continues to advance, giving police opportunities to engage in more and more invasive forms of community surveillance, Montgomery County must have a formal process to inform the use of electronic surveillance. That use must be governed by county regulations, not simply police policy. We urge the, county, uh, the council to reject MCPD's budget request and to use this opportunity to impose greater safeguards on community surveillance moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Pruce. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President and County Council. We have less and less privacy, and drones take in more and more information than the human eye. My name is Tim Pruss, and I'm a resident of Montgomery County and a small business owner. Since 2020, I've owned and operated my drone pro an aerial photography and videography business. A portion of my work entails the use of drones for photojournalism. Over the past three years, I've taken hundreds of photos and videos of first responder incidents, taking in much more information than the human eye. I'm aware of the importance of the loss of privacy, and I'm here to testify in support of the Montgomery County Government Department of Police Drone as First Responder Program. After weighing the trade-off, of a loss of some potential privacy in order for first responders to have significantly better imagery to improve the safety of our officers and the community at large. In September of this year, I attended a presentation by Captain Jason Kokonos and MCPD on his proposed pilot program. It was informative and provided a clear window of how MCPD was planning on implementing its proposed program. What I appreciated about the proposed program was it followed lessons learned from Chula Vista's police department, so it was building off of a, of, a, of a successful program. It's being launched from the rooftops of uh, two buildings in Wheaton and Silver Spring. This will reduce noise pollution, and it also will provide a safer launching point for the drones. This program will also follow the same regulations that govern how police body cameras and dash cameras footage are used and stored. It provides significant transparency, allowing for monitoring and program improvements. What I know, based on my years of experience as an aerial photojournalist, is drones are an excellent tool. They can provide rapid access to high quality information. Getting speedy quality perspectives is crucial for law enforcement. The way the system currently works when 911 calls are dispatched, officers are provided limited information about what is going on with the given situation. Faster and much more high quality imagery makes a difference in apprehending suspects, including threatening criminals and saving lives and citizens in danger. A video image with details providing context would also completely change the officer's ability to respond to 911 calls. Specific facts allowing officers to use their professional training to analyze the scene more accurately would give officers a much higher level of quality information. Certainly privacy is important, and without having experience with this technology, I understand how people could feel anxious about its use. However, a 911 call is not surveillance. Likewise, this program will not be a surveillance program, and it will not be used for monitoring gatherings, rallies, or people. This program will provide trained professionals 
first responders with more information prior to arriving at the scene to be significantly more prepared themselves and those they protect. If we expect from our police force who serve and protect our communities, it is right then to provide them with the access to tools and technology that can improve the preparedness of our officers. I strongly support the pilot initiative of the Montgomery County Department of Police Drone as a First Responder Program. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that testimony. Mr. Hoy. Thank you. Thank you, Council President uh, Glass. I'm here with a colleague, <laughs> Sergeant McGruff, and uh, despite what you may think, we're not here to take a bite out of crime, but rather we're here to take a bite out of the police. Uh, I uh, oppose the uh, uh, supplemental appropriation, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about my background. I'm a retired firefighter for Montgomery County with uh, roughly 30 years of service, uh, including volunteer time. I, I live in Bethesda, close to the Bethel Synagogue, and uh, uh, participate in a community services of various kinds and advocacy uh, during my career and since then. The uh, drones are a very useful tool, and uh, they are useful in a variety of roles outside of police work for local governments. Uh, the program should be reassigned to another agency for use by multiple county departments, including the police. The major issue at play of extending limited police resources more, it should be more directly handled uh, with greater participation and, and engagement. I think that that is what is missing here. We're talking about circling the wagons, going up to the top of a high-rise building. Uh, and doing policing work, rather than uh, integrating better in the community, uh, engaging community members. What we must do is first fully fund police positions. Understaffing and enforced overtime corrode police as well as fire and rescue readiness and community relations. You just can't do the same job when you don't fill the positions. And it creates a corrosive environment. Uh, we need to innovate and leverage community engagement uh, for members of the community who are oftentimes the eyes and ears on the scene. They don't have to fly there. They're there. Um, we need to include uh, private security uh, services uh, in a more active role. They're often there. Federal Realty employs round-the-clock security in Bethesda Row. Um, I called for help to uh, help a injured person um, and needed backup because of the adolescents in the area who are interfering with the patient care. That, uh, that uh, backup was de delayed, yet private security was right there. They weren't called because it's not part of the protocol. So using innovative techniques. Uh, we need to develop a program, and I encourage the police to do this, uh, similar to PulsePoint. PulsePoint.org, O-R-G, is a program that uh, identifies CPR and AED trained individuals, civilians, and uh, monitors voluntarily um, their phone and where they are, and uh, notifies them uh, when there is an unconscious person or a person who stopped breathing that's in their vicinity. They also notify uh, those civilians uh, about where the closest AED is. Do you know where the closest AED is here? So uh, I do because that's part of my discipline, part of my background. So Mr. Hart. Uh, this program is the kind of program that can leverage police resources if re-engineered for police work. Th thank you for your thank testimony, you. Mr. Hoy. Next, uh, I'll invite um, Herman Aravello with uh, translation support. Buenas tardes. Quisiera agradecer la oportunidad de estar aquí de presentarme. Quisiera hablar sobre este tema, bueno, mejor dicho, dos temas, el cual viene involucrando a un solo tema que sería lo de los drones. Eh, mayoritariamente lo sobre las drogas en la, que se utilizan en la escuela ya que es, las drogas son un gran problema que enfrentamos en la comunidad educativa y este mismo 
tenemos que enfrentarlo con seriedad y determinación, ya que esto y no solo impacta la vida actual de los jóvenes, de los actuales estudiantes, impacta a vidas futuras, a lo que podría terminar saliendo futuros delincuentes. Uh, esto es un, una gran amenaza porque esto puede, puede ser, puede ser uh, comunicado, puede ser transmitido, puede ser... Uh, puede ser fomentado incluso por los mismos estudiantes para, para tratar de, de incentivarlos a intentar lo que son las drogas. ¿A qué quiero llegar con este tema? Lo que quiero llegar es que yo doy mi apoyo con los drones porque estos son muy necesarios para el área estudiantil, ya que las escuelas son grandes y las cámaras de seguridad no muchas veces logran captar uh, todas las áreas por las cuales algunos traficantes o estudiantes entran por puntos ciegos y estos mismos terminan logrando hacer que su, su misión de, de seguir transmitiendo uh, el mensaje de, de robar las drogas sigue en pie. Y no solo esto, el dron puede ser utilizado de una manera positiva, ya que en algún, en algún caso nadie sabe, llega a haber algún, algún uh, atentado, la policía puede saber de dónde entraron, cuántas personas involucradas son, incluso cómo van armados y serían los primeros en responder porque ya estarían en el lugar. Honestamente, yo en la escuela no me siento seguro. No me, siento, no me siento cómodo en ese ambiente porque sé que no estoy uh, no rodeado pero sé que no me no, no me no siento con esa seguridad de que cada vez que entro yo en mi salón de clases sé de que estaré enfocado en aprender sino que ahora siempre, siempre con el mismo pánico de que en algún momento algún estudiante pueda convulsionar porque en mi escuela pasaron dos casos de que dos estudiantes lamentablemente perecieron por esto mismo de las, de las drogas y con esto uh, podría ser un, una gran ventaja incluso porque hay algunos estudiantes que algunos estudiantes que manejan ellos entran por, por puntos de clave así y ellos por algún otro, algún otro motivo intentan seguir traficando. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to express myself today. I want to address a very important issue that is affecting educational communities across the world, the problem of drugs in schools. This is an issue that we must face with seriousness and determination as it, as it impacts the lives of our young people, their future in that of our society. Drugs which are illegal uh, pose a serious threat to the well-being of students. We need to recognize that education at school is not only about transmitting, a, uh, transmitting academic knowledge, but also about fostering a safe and healthy environment in which, in which young people can grow and thrive. One of the biggest issues we face is that the level of access students have to drugs. It is crucial that educators and parents recognize this and work together to prevent access to dangerous substances. Education about the risk and consequences of drug use should be an integral part of our student training. We cannot ignore the underlying factors that can lead a uh, young people to become involved with drugs such as stress, peer pressure, and mental health problems. We must provide resources and support to our students so that they can confront these challenges in healthy and constructive ways. Drug abusing schools do not, do not only endanger students' health, but also affects their academic performance and future prospects. It is our responsibility as an educational community to address this problem with empathy and effective solutions. I would like to touch on the topic of school security, which is why I support drones. They are very necessary to cover the school grounds. 
and they could also monitor blind uh, spots that the security cameras cannot capture. For example, if there was an attack, it could be seen from the, from the drone, and thus take immediate action by identifying any subjects, subjects who are armed. This is also another facet of the issue, given that some vehicles enter through the back of the schools or bus access of the institutions, providing access to people from outside to be able to traffic drugs or extract weapons that the students have, so as not to be identified. This could be avoided with the help of drones by identifying um, unauthorized personnel entering the school premises. As a student, I do not feel safe um, in my school, as in my high school there have been two deaths due to opiate consumptions, so this is why I support uh, the drones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. We have one additional person uh, who will be joining us virtually, so you're free to, to leave the table if you want. Um, Cordell Pugh. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We hear you and see you, yes. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Cordell Pugh, and I'm testifying as a private resident today in support of the supplemental appropriation for the drone as first responder pilot program. Thank you to the council president, council, council staff, the county executive, Dr. Sardard and the police department, especially in the Special Operations Division, for their attention to this crucial program. Every day, the Emergency Communication Center, Montgomery County Police Supervisors, and other partners spend hours continually receiving, prioritizing, updating, and shuffling the software computer-aided dispatch queue of pending calls for service. Urgent emergency calls, as well as higher numbers of lower priority calls in shorter periods of time, make response time to these lower priority calls stretch several hours, which is unacceptable. As the Public Safety Committee's work session just yesterday touched on, these delayed response times are misconstrued and misunderstood, and when residents who are expecting police service are not efficiently provided with information, they can frequently assume incorrect reasons why their response is delayed. The drone as first responder pilot program, especially with its integration of live audio from 911 call taking, will be another critical tool to more effectively and efficiently triage and address which of these pending calls for service are truly the most pressing and demand the in-person presence of the first available officers. Drones are already used in Montgomery County Police to rapidly and successfully find missing people, assist with the peaceful resolution of standoffs, and gather vital information during collision reconstructions when victims are un entirely unable to tell their side of the story. Just earlier this month, the Special Operations Division used a drone to help peacefully and swiftly resolve a dynamic and hazardous barricade situation in downtown Silver Spring, footage of which was shared on social media. The Maryland State Police also deployed drones for assistance with a variety of tasks across the state. Anecdotally, various federal agencies here throughout the National Capital Region also use drones for a variety of investigatory and security tasks though there is understandably limited public information regarding their deployments. In 2020, the U.S. Department of Justice published an in-depth report titled Drones, a report on the use of drones by public safety agencies and a wake-up call about the threat of malicious drone attacks. I would urge any in interested council members or council staff to take the time to look over what this report offers, as well as the specific Montgomery County outreach from the Special Operations Division and various other pu publications highlighting the successes other agencies across the country have found by using drones in public safety. Across the river, the Fairfax County Police Department, which added a full-time drone program manager earlier this year, has employed their drones several dozen times this year alone. These tasks have ranged from collision reconstruction and monitoring underwater searches to finding critically missing people and gathering information during dangerous barricade situations. The Fairfax County Police Department also used their drones to assist in documenting five homicide scenes, as well as several more serious injury assaults, where this increased visual documentation will be invaluable during subsequent stages of the investigation and prosecution. Mr. Pugh? Not sooner, once White's Ferry celebrates its long overdue reopening, I would urge the Public Safety Committee, other council members, and council staff to visit these and other 
Northern Virginia agencies currently leading the region in public safety drone deployments. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Pugh. If you have any additional thoughts, please email them to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as noted, a joint public safety and government operations and fiscal policy committee work session is scheduled for October 8th, uh, sorry, 18th. And those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. Uh, with that, this public hearing is now closed. Thank you all very much. Item number 10 is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program and supplemental appropriation to the FY24 capital budget, Montgomery County Government Department of Transportation, hydrogen fuel cell buses and fueling site in the amount of $14,875,975 and the source of funds is federal aid. A Transportation and Environment Committee work session is scheduled for October 23rd. Those wishing to submit materials for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. And the final item on today's agenda is a public hearing on an amendment to the FY23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program. 24-20 Montgomery County Government Department of Transportation Ride on Bus Fleet. A Transportation and Environment Committee work session is scheduled for October 23rd. Those wishing to submit testimony for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and this public hearing is now closed. And with that, we are adjourned for the day. Thank you. and Centers Travelers Advisory Radio System, WP.